So we're there in Genesis chapter number 28, and, and in this chapter we see a few significant events happening. Um, but sort of at the start we see that Jacob and Esau, they sort of differ in relation to obeying their parents and seeking a godly wife rather than just someone that pleases them. We see Jacob does one thing versus Esau doing a different thing. Um, secondly, we see Jacob, he has an encounter with God in this chapter. God comes and he, and he speaks to him in a dream. And then, and then thirdly, we see Jacob talking about the house of God and also promising to give God the tenth of his increase. So <coughs> those are sort of the major points we're going to look at. We'll just jump straight into verse number one. Verse number one, it says, And, ja and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, <coughs> excuse me, and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. So Isaac tells Jacob not to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now, the Bible, just to be clear, the Bible doesn't teach the concept of arranged marriages. We've gone through that before. Remember, the daughters of Zelophehad, headed. they could choose whoever they wanted to. Okay, mm. But having said that, it is wise to listen to the counsel of older people when it comes to choosing a spouse. You know, if your parents are saying, well, I think this might be a good person for you to marry, or maybe... I don't think this would be a good person for you to marry. Then it, it's actually wise. It's actually wise to listen to that. You know, um, have a look in Proverbs chapter number eleven. Proverbs chapter number eleven, in verse number fourteen. Proverbs chapter number eleven, in verse number fourteen. Proverbs eleven verse fourteen says, "Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counsellors there is safety." So notice that, a multitude of counsellors. It's a good idea to actually get counsel. Now, be careful when it says a multitude of counsellors. That doesn't just mean listen to everybody. You know, if you ask everyone for an opinion, I mean, a great pay, a way people do this today, they'll put a, a, post on pay, a, a post on Facebook, and then people will give their opinion. That's not the sort of counsellors we're talking about. Okay, a whole pile of people will tell you all sorts of stuff. I wouldn't listen to any of that, anything that you would find there, okay? But there are, it is a, a good idea to listen to wise people. But the best counsel that we can have is actually God's word. Have a look at Jeremiah, chapter number 23. Jeremiah, chapter number 23. Jeremiah 23, and verse number 18. Jeremiah 23, and verse number 18. It says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, remember we're talking about counsellors, and hath perceived and heard his word, who hath marked his word and heard it. So notice, it says, stood in the counsel of the Lord, and it says, talking about his word, because this is where we get his counsel from. Look at verse number 22, verse number 22. But if they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, and from the evil they're doing. So taking, listening to God's counsel, Listening to his word is going to lead to people turning away from doing what's wrong. Okay, pretty, pretty, pretty sort of sensible sort of thing. <coughs> look back in, um, look back at uh, Proverbs chapter nineteen. Proverbs chapter nineteen, and verse number. Proverbs chapter nineteen and verse number twenty. Proverbs chapter nineteen. I oh, actually look at verse number twenty-one. Proverbs chapter nineteen and verse number twenty-one. It says, "There are many devices in a man's heart." Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. So people get different ideas, but God's counsel, what his ideas are, that's the thing that's going to stand. Verse 20 says, Hear <coughs> counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. So if you want to be wise, listen to counsel. Mm. Listen to instruction. I mean, have you ever met people that they, you can't tell them anything? They just don't want to listen. Mm. Just don't, you know, it's, they just bristle when you tell them something. Mm -hmm. Look back at um, Proverbs chapter number 1. Mm. Proverbs chapter number 1. <coughs> And verse number 23, Proverbs chapter 1, in verse number 23, it says, Turn you at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. So once again, this is God, his words, he's making it known. Because I have called, and ye refused, I stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have set it naught. That means you've ignored all my counsel. And would none of my reproof. So God's trying to, you know, and it's in the person of wisdom here, giving people warning and counsel, and they don't want anything to do with it. He says, well, because you've said it naught, you would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall I call upon me, but I will not answer. Mm. They shall seek me early. 
but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. So what's he saying here? Look, they didn't want counsel from me. They, 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 they despised my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So there's the warning. Listen to counsel from God, and you'll be safe. Otherwise, if you don't, there's just nothing but trouble. And throughout the book of Proverbs, obviously this is talking about counsel from God, but when you read through Proverbs, over and over, you'll often find it's mother and father that are giving the counsel. But the idea is that the wisdom they're imparting is not their wisdom, but God's wisdom. Does that, that sort of all kind of make sense? You know, um, so we should, what we should be doing is listening to God's word. Mum and dad should be listening to God's word and they should be repeating, saying, well, God says this and God says this. Okay, pretty straightforward here. <coughs> Look back at uh, Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter number 28, verse number two. He says, Arise, go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Now, why would you say, why go somewhere else to choose a spouse? Why, why, why is there not just someone around here that you could choose? And I guess the reason for that is because of where they were, the people where they were were particularly godless people. Um, have a look in Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15 and verse number 16. Genesis 15 verse number 16. <coughs> Genesis 15 and verse number 16. And this is God talking to Abram. And he says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So he's describing how he's going to give them this land. And he says about what basically it's going to happen is that, that your descendants, they're actually going to go and they're going to be like um, captives in a land. Um, and they're going, to be, they're going to be in bondage there. And eventually he's going to bring them back. And then when they come back, that's when they're going to possess the land. So he's saying, although you're going to go there, you're not going to possess the whole land to start with. But later on, you're going to possess it. And the reason is because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's not yet full. So they're not as wicked as they can possibly be. But they're, they're already pretty wicked. Okay, And so that's why the people in this land, they're already pretty wicked. And, and it's going to get worse. Look at verse number three. And God Almighty bless thee, <coughs> excuse me, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. <coughs> now notice here what he's saying. He's saying that God's going to bless you and make you fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. So multiplying and multiplying it so we're having lots of children that is a blessing that's called a blessing and right from the very start right from Genesis chapter 1 Genesis chapter 1 it talks about multiplying being a blessing Genesis chapter 1 um, even with regards to animals verse number 22 Genesis 1 22 and God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply on the earth so he blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply have a look at the, that, that was for the animals, but it's the same for people. Have a look at um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. He says, and God blessed them. This is talking to, um, talking to Adam and Eve. He says, and God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God blesses them and says, Be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Have a look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127. We see this throughout the scripture. Children are regarded as a blessing. Psalm number 127, in verse number 1, Psalm 127, <coughs> in verse number 1, says, Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Notice that, he says, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Some people would think that the fruit of the womb, it's like a burden. It's like, oh, kids, who wants all these kids? You have people, they, they sort of think their kids are a burden. And a... No, it says, look, the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth happy. It says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. <coughs> they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are a blessing from God. It's a good thing to have lots of children. It's a good thing to multiply, and you'll be happy when you do. Okay. Now, having said that, though, you want to bring your children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Like, if you, if you just have a lot of children and let them run wild, 
your life might not be that happy. <coughs> you know, if you've seen people have a lot of children, they just run wild. That that not it's not a way to lead to a happy life. Okay, and that's why often some people will only have one children or two children because it's like they didn't want any more because I can hardly handle the ones I've got. Well, it's because you're not bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Mm. Turn back to Genesis chapter twenty-eight. <coughs> Genesis chapter 28, verse number 4. It says, <coughs> verse number 4, it says, And give thee the blessing of Abraham, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. Okay, and so what he's saying here, he's saying, give, what he's actually saying is, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land. So this is actually referring, the blessing of Abraham is getting passed on from Isaac to Jacob. Now you think, didn't we read about that in the previous chapter? Remember there's the whole about stealing the blessing? But this seems to be a different blessing, because if you look back at chapter 27, chapter 27 and verse number 27, this is when, when Jacob you know, tricked his, his father and stole Esau's blessing. Verse 27, he says, And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine, and let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. <coughs> and it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made him into blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Now see the blessing there. That seems different. He's blessed him with stuff. But did he give him the blessing of Abraham? Did he give him the land? No. So it seems to me that that whole thing with Jacob, um, you know, stealing the blessing. Well, I mean, he was going to get the blessing that God had said he was going to get anyway. So he didn't really need to do that. He was going to get the blessing because God is the one who had said, in Isaac shall I seed be called. And then it was once again, it was going to go on to the younger son. It was going to go on to Jacob. God had already decided that. Okay, and so he didn't really need to do the stuff that we saw that went on. <coughs> you know, Jacob didn't need to deceive Isaac to get the blessing. Let's look back in verse, uh, chapter 28, verse 5. It said, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to paid in Aram unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, <coughs> the Syrian, uh, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. So ja ja Isaac sends Jacob to paid in Aram to, 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 Rebe to Bethuel, Rebekah's brother. He's saying, you know, go back to this homeland, and that's where you're going to find um, a good wife there. Verse number six, <coughs> when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paden Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Paden Aram, and Esau seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So Esau sees that Jacob obeys his parents, doesn't he? He sees he obeys them. And of course, that's what the Bible says that's what should happen. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with them, thou must live long on the earth. So it's a, it's a commandment that has promise. If you obey that, you'll have a long life. Okay, he should obey his parents. And so Esau sees that Jacob does that. So what does Esau try and do? Well, he tries to make things right by taking another wife, which is not of the daughters of Cain. He says, look, I've got these two wives already. They've, already, they've made mum and dad really sad. And so, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll take me another wife that's descended from Ishmael. So it's not, she's not from the daughters of the land. But I mean, if you've already done one thing wrong, like, it's like adding, well, let's just take another wife. So, so adding sin to sin is not going to fix things. It's just going to, it's just going to make things worse. I mean, you can't, fix a bad choice by making another bad choice on top of it. Adding a bad choice to a bad choice just lends more bad. I mean, we see a good example of this. Keep your finger there in Genesis 28. We see a good example of this right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter number 4. And one of the first people who made a really bad choice was Cain. In Genesis chapter number 4, in verse number 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, <coughs> and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock, and of the fat thereof, 
And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. Cain's really angry. And his countenance fell. He's angry, and you can see it on his face. Okay? And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Mm. So God said, look, if you do what's right, you're going to be accepted. So you made a bad choice, make a good one. Okay? But what does Cain do? He adds to his bad choice, and adds another bad choice. Verse number 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they are in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So he did bad to start, mm. and then he does worse. You know? So adding bad to bad... <coughs> It's, it's, it's never a good idea, and it doesn't work out um, for Cain, and it's not a good idea if you've made it. So, just applying it back to where we are in Genesis 28. If you've made the wrong choice by marrying the wrong person, you can't fix it by marrying someone else. Because when you, and we'll actually look a bit at this later, when you make a vow to someone, you make a promise. So, what you need to do is keep your promise. And God can still bless you within that. You know, say for example, someone's got married... Then they've got divorced. Then they've got, they've got married again. Okay, and then they discover what the Bible talks about, about how you're not supposed to get divorced. And it's like, well, okay, well, stick with the wife you've got because you've made a promise to her or your husband you've got, you've made a promise to him. Stay with them and don't break your promise again. Okay, because you, you can't go back and change the past. But you can say, well, from now on, I'll do what's right. From this point on, I'll do what's right. <coughs> Look down at verse number 10. Verse number 10. And Jacob went out <coughs> from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows <coughs> and lay down in that place to sleep. So Jacob finds a place to sleep. Now, I don't know, pillows of stone doesn't sound very comfortable to me. Mm. But I mean, when you're on a mission, sometimes you have to endure discomfort. You do, you sometimes have to endure discomfort. One of my favourite Proverbs is Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. There's a lot in this one, Proverbs 20 verse 4. It says, The sluggard will not plough by reason of the cold, and therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. Mm. Notice that? The sluggard, the lazy person, won't plough. He won't work in the field. Why? Because it's cold. So he's got a reason, he's got an excuse. I won't plough because it's cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. So he doesn't have anything. Why doesn't he have anything? Because he's got no harvest. He's having to beg. Why? Because he didn't do any work. Why? Because it was cold. Okay, and so we can see what happens. Because he's lazy, he, 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 he's basically looking at, at excuses. And the thing is, in whatever situation you find yourself in life, you can either make things happen, you can make positive changes in your life, or you can make an excuse. You can't do both. If you make an excuse, then you won't get out of the, the bad situation you're in. You know, people who make excuses, they stay in those situations. You know, you can't have the excuse and have the positive change. Um, I, mean, I was reading something recently about, about some lady and they're, they're saying about, you know, how poverty's so terrible and this lady, she's got hardly anything to live on. And, um, and they're saying this woman hasn't had, she hasn't been able to buy fruit and veggies for uh, two or three years, I think they said. Because she just has hardly anything. She's only got, I can remember, was it like 30 bucks or 30, 30 something dollars or whatever she had a week left over after she paid the essential things. But it was interesting when I read the article, because it did say, well, now and again she buys tobacco if she wants to really go to town. If she's just feeling, you know. So it wasn't it that she didn't have any money ever at all, because it said sometimes she bought tobacco. Okay? Well, if instead of buying tobacco she bought fruit and veggies, she wouldn't be able to say, I hadn't bought fruit and veggies for, for, for two years. Not only that, she had a $1,000 higher purchase. I think she'd bought like a fridge or something like that. $1,000 on higher purchase to pay for a fridge. Well, the thing about it is, this lady, obviously she didn't have a lot of money. But I mean, I've never spent $1,000 on a fridge. I, I don't, I, I've never bought a new fridge ever. My fridges have always been second hand, third hand, fourth hand. I mean, I'm pretty sure for a hundred bucks, you could get a fridge from somewhere. Uh, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be actually too, it wouldn't be too tricky. You know, people were saying, oh, well, you know, the, oh, but what about, you know, you need, you need the internet if you want to go and trade me to get a fridge. Well, did you know you can actually get the internet for free? There's a place called the library. 
the public library. They've got all of these books that are free, and they've even got computers that are free, and it's even got the internet for free. You know, so it's there if you want it, for people who want it. Okay, and it's interesting. I remember, um, and you might remember there's an account in John chapter five. We remember where John came to the, the pool. It was, I think it was the pool of Bethesda, and there was a there was a, a lame man lying there, you know, waiting for the moving of the water because an angel would step in at a time, and whoever stepped in first was healed. <coughs> and Jesus comes to this guy who's lying there, and he says an interesting thing to him. He says, "Wilt thou be made whole?" So Jesus was basically saying to him, "Do you want to be well? Do you want to get better?" Because often sometimes people, they can be in a bad situation, but it's almost like they don't want to get better. It's like they want pity. They want to comp they want to have something, have you ever heard that expression? Some people are never happy unless they've got something to complain about. They want to be in a bad situation so they can whinge and moan and complain about it. And they don't actually want to come out of the situation because then they wouldn't have anything to complain about. You know, And, and you find that when someone's in that sort of mode, things never get better for them. And they just make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. I mean, I knew a guy one time who he would spend. He had, and, and this was he didn't have an income, but he had cars that were worth thousands. I think one of the cars he had was like about thirteen thousand dollars. I think it was. I've never owned a car that cost that much ever. You know, and I've had jobs for years making lots of money. I've never spent that much amount on, on a car. Why? Because it, it wouldn't be a, a wise thing. Well, would it be a wise thing for a beneficiary to spend all of their savings they had from something previous on that? No, it's a, it's a crazy idea, okay? But, and so, <coughs> an important thing we need to understand, we don't want to look for excuses. If you look for an excuse, you'll stay right where you are. Let's get back in Genesis uh, 28. Genesis 28, verse number, verse number 12. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land on thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be <coughs> as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So, God comes to Jacob in a dream. And he confirms the blessing that Isaac gave him, which the Lord first gave to Abraham. Remember, remember right back in Genesis chapter number 12, he gave him that, that, that promise about in thee all nations shall be blessed. Well, he's passing that on, that same thing. And that's talking about, you know, through the nation of Israel, which is what Jacob's name eventually gets changed to, um, the Bible says, unto them were committed the oracles of God. And so the gospel goes out through the nation of Israel. I mean, Jesus Christ came through the nation of Israel. Now, just a note here, of course, God comes and speaks to Jacob in a dream. Notice that he's speaking to Jacob in a dream. Now, a lot of Christians think that God speaks to them all the time in dreams. You know, that he's giving them some special personal revelation in order to show them how to live their lives. You know, <coughs> and um, in fact, if you speak to unsaved religious people, you know, Catholics, Mormons, people from various cults, you'll find that this, this is a widespread attitude. You know, God has just supposedly revealed all sorts of things to them, which, surprise, surprise, directly contradicts what the Bible actually says. You know, and what they're really doing, they're actually really listening to their own heart rather than God. And the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can not? But among people who are saved, that shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't be doing that. You know, turn, turn, to, um, turn to Hebrews chapter number one. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number one. It's important that we understand how it is that God speaks to us. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number one. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number one <coughs> and verse number one. Hebrews chapter one verse one says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse or different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God spake by the prophets, but now he speaks by his Son. That's Jesus. Jesus is called the Word of God. So that's how God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his Word. Have a look at Second Peter. Second Peter, just after Hebrews, you've got James, then you've got 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 
um, 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 16. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we may know unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So he's saying, look, we saw the majesty of Jesus Christ. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honour and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him <coughs> in the holy mount. So Peter's recalling when him and Jesus, and I think probably James and John, they went up the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus was transformed before them. He became shining white like a, you know, like the sun. It's like, and they said, wow. And, 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 um, and then a voice came from heaven. God the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Peter heard God the Father speaking to God the Son out of heaven. This is what he heard. He said, we were witnesses of this. But notice what Peter then says, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So imagine if you were walking along one day and you saw Jesus in the flesh. Not that you would have, but if, maybe if you were back then when Peter was. You saw Jesus in the flesh and you heard God the Father speaking to him. You think, wow. What does he say? We've got a more sure word of prophecy. We've got something better than that. What have we got? We've got the Bible. This is the more sure word. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well, you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. So we've got something that's better than hearing God the Father speak. We've got this. Because do you think if Peter thought back to what happened, do you think he could necessarily recall exactly what it now, what exactly did God say? What exactly was it? What happened again? You know, maybe his memory was like mine. You know, maybe it's like some of ours where it's like, what was that again? What happened last week? But with this, we know. Okay? Because God's word, it never changes. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, um, yeah, it's important that we understand that God's word is the reliable thing. This is how God speaks to us. We don't need some new... Um, extra special revelation we don't need the you know hey the bible records what happened to jacob but that's not the thing that we should be looking for that's not the thing that we should be expecting and people who do that who get guided by their dreams they get guided in the wrong path because satan will come and disguise himself as an angel of light and speak to someone in their dreams and lead them down the wrong path okay let's get back to um let's back to uh back to genesis chapter 28 i'm trying to make it short because we've got um cake and ice cream, so, and I'm not sure if my voice is going to last long either. So, um, <coughs> back in Genesis chapter number 28, verse number, verse number 16. <coughs> and Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. <coughs> so Jacob didn't realise that the Lord was in this place. <coughs> Now, obviously, God is everywhere. God is everywhere. Ha have a look at um, Jeremiah, chapter number 23. Jeremiah, chapter number 23, and verse number 24. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. Jeremiah 23, verse 24 says, Can any hide himself in secret places, that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven <coughs> and earth, saith the Lord. So God says he fills heaven and earth. God is everywhere. Omnipresent is the word we use to describe that. Have a look at um, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. <coughs> Psalm 139 says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasses, that means my you surround, <coughs> thou compasses my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Mm. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, <coughs> I cannot attain unto it. Look at verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven... Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
I will take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. I will say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light <coughs> are both a light to thee. So we see, God is everywhere, up in heaven, down in hell, everywhere we go, whether it's light, whether it's dark. You know, you can't hide from God. God is everywhere. But God is in some places in a special way. Have a look at Exodus chapter number 13. Exodus chapter number 13. Exodus chapter number 13 and verse number 20. Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 20. <coughs> Exodus 13, 20. Exodus chapter 20, uh, 13 and verse 20. It says, And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So it says God, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. So God was in the pillar of the cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So God appeared as this pillar of cloud so they could see it in the daytime. And then at night time, we well, wouldn't be able to see a cloud at night time, so it was a pillar of fire. So they could see it day and night they could see it. That's where God was. God was there in a special way. <coughs> um, Genesis um, chapter 28, where we were, um, it describes where God was there. Have a look back again at Genesis 28. Genesis 28, verse number 17. Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. He says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So this is where God was in a special way. In the house of God. Now that might remind you of the New Testament. In the New Testament, if you look in um, 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 15. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 15. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. He says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So see, this is where the house of God, and it's described as the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so God is, in a special way, in the house of God. Okay, It says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I, in the midst of them, okay? Where two or three gather together in the name of, of Jesus, in God's name, God's here specially. When we meet here, God meets with us because we, we're meeting in his name. And that when it says in his name, that's talking about like in his authority, you know? God, <coughs> God is in a special way when we meet in his authority. Church, because of that, church is important, okay? It's, that's why it's an important thing to come to church because that's where you'll meet God. That's where you'll hear from God in a special way. Now, when we're sitting at home and reading our Bibles, we hear from God and we meet, meet with God. But when we come to church, we also hear from God and we meet with God in a special way. And that's why God was ordained that, you know, I mean, God loved the church so much. Jesus loved the church so much that he died for the church, the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So Christ gave himself for the church. Have a look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse number... <clears throat> Hebrews 10 <coughs> verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So over and over God, he says... Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We live in a day where sadly many people do. They forsake assembling themselves. So they are oh, church, it doesn't matter, I'll just come down again. Church is not important. He says, look, don't forsake yourself, the assembling of yourselves together. And he says, so much the more as you see the day approaching. <coughs> as Jesus' return comes closer, we should be gathering together more, not gathering together less. Now it's true that um, the Bible does refer to, for example, the... The, the, each individual believer, each individual believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Okay, it says, for example, in First Corinthians chapter number three, First Corinthians chapter number three, verse sixteen says, "Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you?" 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So God does dwell in believers. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, so we should look after them. That's why we should be careful what goes into our bodies, not, not abuse our bodies, not treat our bodies badly, you know, abuse it with drugs and alcohol and, and, and stuff. And, and it talks about in Corinthians as well, it talks about like joining with an harlot. It says, well, that's the two become one flesh. Should I take God and join him with a harlot? Obviously not, you know. Um, in fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, it says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So God dwells among his people, individually, but also in a special way within a group of believers. Okay? <coughs> um, now, one of the reasons we saw before, in fact, if you turn back there again, turn back to First Timothy chapter number 3, one of the reasons we saw before is that um, church is important is because it's described as the pillar and ground of the truth. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 14, uh, of verse, verse 14 says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is supposed to be the ground of the truth. This is where the truth exists, is in God's church. That means that when God's word says something, we need to take a stand for it. Even when it's not pleasant. You know, I mean, we, we talked about it earlier on, you know, that, that whole thing, throwing someone out of church. Is that a pleasant thing, to throw someone out of church? No, it's clearly, it's not. But I mean, you might ask, well, how many churches throw people out today? And I think you'll find it's pretty rare. I don't think you'll find most churches wouldn't be throwing people out. I mean, I went to a church where um, the pastor had been pastoring for nearly 30 years, and in that whole time, do you know how many people got thrown out? And this is a good Bible-believing church. How many people got thrown out? One. In that entire time. And he said he hoped he never had to do it again. Well, look, if you can be a pastor of a church for 30 years and you only ever throw one person out, that kind of suggests that either the people in your church and the people in your community are these amazing people, or else you're just not doing what the Bible says. Which one do you think it is? I think it's probably just a case of you're not doing what the Bible says. Now, so now um, have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because the Bible is pretty clear about this. That, you know, a lot of churches will have a sign saying, all welcome. All welcome. Well, it's an interesting thought. Is everyone welcome to come to this church? No, they're not. Everyone is not welcome to come to this church because there are people that the Bible says should be put out from among you. Now, do we go? We go and preach the gospel to everybody. We don't hold it back from anyone because Jesus said, go into the world, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we'll preach the gospel to everyone. But not everyone is welcome in this church. Okay, because the church is supposed to be, it's the pillar and ground of the truth, it's supposed to be a, a holy place. Now, we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. None of us will ever be perfect until Jesus comes back. But the fact is, not all sin is equal. Okay, every sin that people do is not the same. Okay, am I a sinner? Yes, I am. But did you know that there are sins that if I committed, I would no longer be able to be a pastor? Did you know that? Well, guess what? There are sins that if people are doing them, they're not allowed to be in a church. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 1. says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So someone's sleeping with his stepmother. Okay? He says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. <coughs> in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you gather together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's saying, look, deliver such an one unto Satan. That's saying, put him out of the church. He shouldn't be in the church. You know, that the spirit may be saved in the Lord Jesus. Now, Notice it's saying, is that what's the desire for the person? 
that the Spirit may be saved. The purpose of the pers- of putting them out of the church is you want them to be saved. Now, sometimes it will be a person who's already saved, but because of what we see, we're going to see following, they can't be in the church. Maybe it's someone who's not saved, and they still need to be put out of the church, so maybe that they'll wake up, and maybe they'll get saved. Okay? Um, verse number six. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's talking about like a little bit of yeast. You put a little bit of yeast in, it goes through everything. So it's saying a little bit of sin goes through everything. It's sin spreads. Okay? Purge out, therefore. Purge out. Notice purge out means get rid of. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, <coughs> not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. He says, look, I've written you a letter, don't hang out with fornicators. That means people who are sleeping with people they're not married, don't hang out with them. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or the idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. So he's saying, look, I said not to hang out with fornicators, but he says, I'm not talking about just general fornicators in the world, because you'd have to leave the world. Because the world is full of fornicators. I mean, you know, if you work in a workplace, if you go to a school, if you go to a university, if you go to the shop, you're going to be hanging around fornicators because they're all over the place. But he says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So this is someone who's saved. (coughs) Be a fornicator. Now some people say, oh, well, if you're saved, you wouldn't be a fornicator. Well, that doesn't seem to match. Um... (coughs) If anyone that's called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judges. So the people that are fornicators and stuff, God's going to judge them. But the people that are inside the church, you're supposed to judge. And what does it say? Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That's what it says. The wicked person, put them away from among yourselves. It's saying, put them out of the church. Put them out of the church. Okay? So clearly, if someone's a drunk, if someone's a fornicator, if someone's doing some of these things, they've got to be put out of the church. And that's it. And that's why. That's why someone had to be put out of the church. It's not a pleasant thing, but that's what has to happen. Okay? Why? Because this is our authority. It's not a case of what, what I might feel like, what other people might feel like. It's a case of what does God want? You know? Because some people think it's about, well, let's just, we're in a popularity contest. But it's not a popularity contest. You know, Paul says, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I yet seek to please men? He says, for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Mm. So if I'm up here trying to please the people, I'm not being Christ's servant. I'm not doing what God wants us to do. Mm. (coughs) Let's get back to um, Genesis 28. Let me finish up. Genesis 28. (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. It's an unpleasant subject, but it just has to be done. And that's just the fact. It's, I would rather be in a small church where people love God than in a great big church where just anything goes. And it's just full of sin. It's full of wickedness. And God's not going to be happy about it. God doesn't think that it's a good thing at all. You know? Um, okay, have a look here. Um, back in Genesis 28, verse number 18. Genesis 28, verse number 18. It says, And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and he set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that place was called Luz at the first. So he rose up early in the morning, and that's a great thing to remember, actually, and we won't do it now, but look throughout the Bible, and so many examples you see of people who rose up early in the morning. Here we see Jacob rose up early in the morning. Back in Genesis 22, Abraham, guess what he did? rose up early in the morning. Exodus 24, what did Moses do? Rose up early in the morning. Joshua, rose up early in the morning. Samuel, rose up early in the morning. Job, rose up early in the morning. David, rose up in the, early in the morning. Jesus himself, Jesus himself, rose up early. In fact, look, I, I said we wouldn't look, but we'll just look at one. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark, Remember, Jesus is supposed to be our example that we should follow his steps. Well, look at this. Mark chapter 1, and verse number 35. And in the morning... Mark 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So what did Jesus do? He rose up early in the morning. Back in Genesis 28. Genesis 28. 
uh, says that he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that place was called Luz at the first. So he called it Bethel. <coughs> and Bethel just means the house of God. Okay? That's what it's saying. It's the house of God. That um, Beth is a Hebrew word for house, and Al is a word for God. So you're saying, do we need, need to go back to Hebrew to understand that? Not really. Because he's already said this back in verse 17. He says, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And then when he says it's called Bethel, well, guess what? What does it mean? The house of God. <coughs> it's all right there. Have a look at verse number 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. So here we see Jacob vowing a vow. Now, vowing a vow is not necessarily something that we should be doing. Okay, a lot of people like to make vows, but it's not necessarily something we should be doing all the time. Look at James chapter number 5, verse number 12. James chapter 5, James chapter 5 and verse number 12. <coughs> James chapter 5 and verse number 12. It says, but above all things, my brethren, swear not. Now that's not talking about like swearing or blaspheming. It's saying when you swear, it's like making an oath, making a, you know, promising something. He says, swear not, neither by heaven... Neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. So he's saying, look, you know, just, if you mean yes, just say yes. If you mean no, just say no. Don't go making vows all the time. And we, could, we won't do it for sake of time. We could, there's many places we could go and look where people made vows and it was, they got themselves into trouble. There was a guy in the book of Judges called Jephthah. And he made a, he, he, he vowed a vow. And he said, if God would give him victory in the battle they were going to do, that he said, whatever first comes out of his house to meet him, he was going to offer it up for a burnt offering. He's thinking he's going to come home, or maybe the dog's going to come out, or some animal's going to wander out. He gets home from the battle, <coughs> his one and only daughter is the first, that's the person that comes out. And so what did he do? He ended up, he ended up doing what he'd said he would do. But why? He was in a lose, there was nothing you could do. Now I think, personally, if it was me, I would have done the other thing. I, would, I wouldn't have sacrificed my daughter. But guess what? You make a promise to God and then you don't follow through on it. You've, you're in, that's a bad thing to do. And so he put himself in a lose-lose situation. Either way you did it, it was going to be, you know, there was nothing good that come out of it. Now, I'm not saying that, that vows are always a bad thing. I'm not saying vows are always a bad thing. I mean, what about a wedding vow? You know, think about a wedding vow. You make a promise to someone, okay? You make it in the sight of God. But... Um, <coughs> A promise that you make to your spouse. You should keep that vow. But making a vow is not something that you should be in a hurry to do. Have a look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes, you'll just find that after the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5. Ecclesiastes chapter number 5 and verse number 1. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1. It says, Keep thy foot. When thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Verse 2, be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. How do you know a fool? Multitude of words. Verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. <coughs> for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So pretty clear. Don't be in a hurry to make a vow. If you're going to vow, you better pay what you're going to vow. And especially, you know, making a vow to God. Be careful. You know, it's not something, <coughs> it's not something you should rush into. Let's finish up. Verse number... Back in Genesis 28, verse number 22. <coughs> Genesis 28, verse number 22. And he said, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. You know, mind this what we said before. The house of God is a pillar and ground of the truth. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So Jacob promises to give the tenth to God. This is what's known as the tithe. Okay, the tithe, the word tithe just means tenth. Now, notice where this occurs. It occurs, where is it? It's in the house of God. This is where the tithe is going on. Turn, if you would, to Malachi. Malachi chapter number 3. Because we see this principle of the tithe spoken of throughout the Bible. 
Malachi chapter number 3, which is the last <coughs> book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter number 3, verse number 8. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So God's saying, yeah, You've robbed me in the tithes and in the offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, <coughs> saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So God's promising. He's saying, pay all your tithes and you'll be blessed. And if you, and if you do, what will I do? I'll rebuke the devourer. In other words, think of the, some sort of animal that's going to come or an insect that's going to come and devour your crops is what that sort of the picture that's being talked of. He says, I will, <coughs> I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll stop these things happening. But that sort of suggests if you don't pay, God's going to take his hands off. The locust might come in, destroy all you've got, you know. And, and so <coughs> what we can see, a principle is when we pay to God what we owe, when we pay our tithes, when we pay our offerings, God will keep back things which could have cost us lots of money. Things which could have, you know, um, it, it could have been damaging to us financially. He says, I'll rebuke the devourer for thy sake. Now, some people say, well, but that's just in the Old Testament. It was only in the Old Testament, just in the Old, specifically the Old Testament law. But the thing is, we can look before the law was given, before the time of Moses, Abraham gave tithes. Here we just saw Jacob gave tithes. And in fact, in the New Testament, we see the same principle. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 1. It says, am, this is Paul speaking, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ the Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and the Cephas? He's saying, look, aren't we allowed to eat and drink? Yeah, sure, obviously. Aren't we allowed to get married? You know, as, as the other apostles are? Yeah, sure. Verse 6, Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? He's saying, don't we have the, the power to forbear working? He's saying, aren't we allowed not to work? And he might say, well, what's he talking about there? How can we say you've got the power not to work? What he's talking about there is he's talking about paid employment. He's talking about, don't we have the power to not go out and work a secular job? Like, these other people did. The other apostles, like Peter and James and these other ones, they forbore work. And why? Because they were paid for by, as the people gave their tithes and offerings, part of that paid for the people who were, who were running the church, if you like, to live. Now, Paul, he didn't do that. He, he worked for a living. He was a tent maker. He supported himself as different places we saw he go around. That's what he did. Have a look at verse number seven. <coughs> verse number seven it says, Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? Who planted the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say are these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So he's saying, look, <coughs> we've got the power to take money in the same way that Peter and these other ones have. We've got this power to do that, but we haven't do it. We haven't done it. So you don't have to do that. But the point here is saying is that as a minister of the gospel, you have a right to be paid. So what that's saying is, as a pastor of this church, I have a right to be paid. Now, I don't, I'm like Paul, I don't take that power. I don't take, when people give money, none of that goes to me. It just goes for the church. It just looks paying for rental of the property, you know, any bills that we have. You know, we go bowling, you know, we, we pay for food. In fact, that's a very biblical thing. People like wonder, how come we have these meals and, and the food's all provided? And you don't have to pay any for any of it. Well, remember what it said in Malachi. It said, bring you all the tithes 
into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. That's why when you come to church, you come to a church lunch, you go out to some meal that we have, you don't pay a cent. That's why. Because God's house, it's paid for. So people, people pay their tithes, people pay their offerings, and there's, all, and there's always enough. Okay, <coughs> But what Paul is saying is he did have the right to do that, but he didn't take advantage of that. And so I'm the same as that. I don't, I've got a job, so I don't need to be paid. I can support myself. But having said that, one day when the church is bigger, hey, maybe it would be more work to do, and so it would be reasonable for me to get paid and not have to work another job as well. That would be good. I would, I'd be able to get a little bit more sleep. You know, I'd be able to spend a little bit of time with my family. That'd be a good thing. But the point is, it's okay to get paid. It's a normal thing. Um, but and, but the, the reason why I'm mentioning this is not for my benefit. It's not because I'm wanting money. It's not because the church is needing. The church has got thousands of dollars. We're doing great. But really the thing is, <coughs> it's actually for your benefit. That's why I'm saying it's for your benefit. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Depending on how much you give, depends on how much you get. Okay? It says in verse number 7, Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Okay? Now understand, when I'm saying... When you give, you receive. That's not necessarily directly. It's not like it's like well, I put ten dollars in the plate and then I'll receive a hundred dollars. No, God will bless us in all sorts of ways. There are many ways that God. We can be blessed in our health. We can be blessed <coughs> with our families. We can be blessed in our jobs and all sorts of stuff like that. But the point about it is, God can bless. But in order for us to be blessed, we should be obedient. You know, the, the, the door to blessing lies, the, the path to blessing lies through the door of obedience, okay? So, in conclusion, we, we, we whipped through quickly because we were about to have something to eat. Um, we saw that Jacob and Esau, they differed with regards to their, their different decisions in obeying their parents, seeking a godly wife. You know, versus just, you know, Esau just went for what pleased him, okay? Um, we saw that Jacob, he had an encounter with God in a dream. This is not something that we should be seeking today. This is the place we want to hear from God, is in his word. And then last we saw Jacob, he was talking about the house of God, and God promising to give God the tenth of his increase. Okay? And um, <coughs> the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Remember we saw that? It's important that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And if we leave that truth, you know, I mean, a lot of churches have left the truth which says there are things that you can be thrown out of a church for. A lot of churches have left that. And the fact, as churches leave God's truth, eventually God can reach the stage where he says, I don't even see you as a church anymore. I don't even see you as a church anymore. In fact, I said that was the last one. One last scripture we'll look at is just in Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2 and verse number 1. <coughs> this is Jesus speaking to a church. In fact, he speaks to seven different churches. But the first one he speaks to here in, in Revelation 2 verse 1, he says, And unto the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and now thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. That means change. Repent and do the first works, or else I come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You're saying, well, what's that talking about? Remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Well, if we look back at the end of the previous <coughs> chapter, it says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which are sorest are the seven churches. So when God's saying, I'll remove your candlestick, he's saying, I'll remove your church. He'll say, you won't be a church anymore. And the fact is, there are many churches today which are called a church, but in God's eyes, they're not a church. There are many churches where they don't listen. God says, this is what it's supposed to be. And we say, well, we don't pay any attention to that. God says, throw certain people out of church. That's fine. Everyone's welcome. The God says the pastor is supposed to be a man. People say, oh, no, woman preachers. That's fine. Most importantly, the Bible says what the gospel is. For by grace you save through faith that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. And people say, oh no, we have a different gospel. You're saved by works. Come to church. Get baptised. Give your money. Do this. Do the next thing. 
That's how you're saved. Well, guess what? Do you think God considers that a church? No. A church can reach a stage where God will remove the candlestick, and in his eyes, it's no longer a church. But what should, what should a church be? It should be the <coughs> pillar and ground of the truth. Okay? You know, allowing everyone to come to church, that pleases men, but it doesn't please God. We should look to please God in everything that we do within this church, and that's my prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for the many things we can learn from the life of Jacob, Lord. Thank you that, <coughs> yeah, he was a man uh, with all his faults, but that he was uh, a faithful man. He, uh, he heard from you. He promised to give the tenth unto you. And he prophetically spoke about the, the house of God and the fact that uh, we know that today that's the New Testament church, that it is the pillar and ground of the truth. Help us, Lord, always to hold on to your truth. Help us to be a place of truth that we would hold to you, hold to your word. Lord, we thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.